If you are a real estate investor or you want to be an even more successful real estate investor and you're looking for ways to fund your deals without having to rely on the local banks, the mortgage companies, the hard money lenders, or any lender out there that makes the rules other than yourself, you're in the right place. If this is your first time to the show, I want to welcome you. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and welcome to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. Thank you for being a part of a movement. We are almost at 200,000 downloads and listens since we launched the show. I have amazing guests and experts. And in fact, today on today's show, it's no exception. In just a moment, I'm going to be introducing you my special guest. It will be his first time on the show. And what an expert he is. He's all about private money. He raises private money. And so he's a perfect fit for the show. But before I get to my special guest, I just want to let everybody know that I've got a free online class right now, absolutely free, that will take you through the five easy steps of getting private money for your deals. And here it is. Go to www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. That's J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money podcast. And so with that, I want to ask everybody also to be sure if you're listening on iTunes, be sure to subscribe and rate and review. If you're watching one of the YouTube channels, be sure and subscribe. Put your questions in the comment section below. We'll get all your questions answered as it relates to real estate investing. And one last thing before I bring my guest on, in case you're brand new to the show, I just want to let you know who Jay Connor is. My wife, Carol Joy, and I, we've been investing in single family houses in Eastern North Carolina for 16 years. And the first six years, we relied on the local banks to fund our deals. But we got cut off with no notice back in 2009. I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money. And since that time, I've never missed out on a deal because I didn't have the funds. We're not talking hard money. We're not talking institutions. We're not talking mortgage companies. We're not talking banks. We're talking about private money. And with that, I'm going to bring on my special guest right now. First time on the show. I'm so happy to have my very good friend and buddy, Mr. Dave Parachin. And before I bring him on, let me tell you about Dave. First of all, Dave is self-proclaimed and I believe him. He is the number one acquisitionist in the United States. He understands what real estate investing is all about. He knows how to carve up deals. He knows how to talk to sellers. He knows how to put deals together. He knows how the psychology of a seller works. And because of that, he has borrowed and paid back over $10 million in private funds to his private lenders. He right now has owed North or around six or $7 million that he's got out on the streets. He's still raising private money. His actual niche and his target area is in Columbus, Ohio. And I'll tell you what, if you Google, because I have, if you Google him in Columbus, Ohio, he is on the first all five pages on Google. He has got dialed in search engine optimization if you want to know how to promote your business. But he's an expert, in addition to that, at buying off-market properties. He knows how to find them. He's got an extensive rental portfolio. So my buddy Dave is all about private money, building the portfolio, and focusing on single-family houses. And what's more important than all that is that his entire package is wrapped in being a servant's heart. I know what he's like. We're in a mastermind together. And I know and I've seen Dave give back like nobody else gives back. Dave Perichin, what an honor it is to have you on the show. Welcome, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> hey, Dave, how are you doing, my man? I just saw you last week and you were awesome last week. Let's rock and roll, man. Let me tell you this real quick. So when it comes to being the number one acquisitionist for single family, let me clarify that. There's a lot of people who know how to buy mobile home parks better than I do, know how to buy multifamily. But when it comes to single family off-market real estate, I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with if you run an acquisitions company, if you're a real estate company, put your best acquisitions guy up against me. We'll do it for charity. And the only thing that's going to come out of that is we're all going to get more deals. But super grateful to be here. Jay, you're somebody I highly respect. I want to get right into this stuff. 
and add as much value to your listeners as I possibly can. I appreciate it, Dave. So let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm going to piggyback off of something you just said, and that is, you know, put yourself up against any other acquisitionist team. You're fantastic. So here's the question. What are the mistakes that most real estate investors who are negotiating with sellers or what are the mistakes that most acquisitionists make and what is it that sets you apart from being able to take down more deals? It's super easy that the number one mistake that people make is they don't listen to the seller's needs or understand the seller's needs or know how to hear exactly what's going on. And they just go at every appointment immediately thinking price. And they immediately, you know, am thinking, what can I get this house for rather than what can I do to meet the seller's needs? Because you'd be surprised more times than not, you know, the seller doesn't always need an all cash offer. They don't need the money. Sometimes they just need debt relief or sometimes they have another motive. So I think really what separates somebody experienced like myself in buying off market deals is just slowing the appointment down understanding the seller's needs and creating an offer that's going to meet their needs and provide a great deal for your portfolio. Well, let's just go ahead and share with my audience how it is that you're qualified to talk about what you're talking about. So how many deals have you done and when did you start? So I've been around the block, you know, I'm 37 right now in 2019 when this is being recorded. And I actually started all the way back in 2005. And I started out in Phoenix, Arizona, and I just went to a couple of RIA meetings and the market was smoking hot in Phoenix and, you know, it was all built on speculation back then. And I just started driving around neighborhoods and finding, you know, boarded up junkers and tracking down the owners and putting them in contract and selling the properties. Wholesaling is how I got my start. And I was 23 years old. I made well over six figures my very first year doing it. I thought I was on top of the world, but I had no financial literacy whatsoever, Jay. I ended up losing everything and completely going belly up. But that is one of the best things that could have happened to me because that made me realize I don't want to just be a flipper my whole life. I want to understand cash flow and I want to build a portfolio. And that's what I've done since that time. I moved to back to Ohio where I'm originally from. My business partner, RJ Pino had a small wholesaling company here in Columbus, Ohio, where we operate. And we started buying rentals together back in 2012, started buying rentals with private money. Everything, our entire business, our entire portfolio is built with private money, Jay. So we've done hundreds of transactions. Our current rental portfolio is over 100 single family homes and we're buying more. I put three in contract this past weekend. Right now, it's a great time to flip. So we do still do some flipping and whatnot, a little wholesaling here and there to fill the cash flow gaps. But we are all about the buy and hold. And you know, we're currently raising private capital to buy houses, buy more houses, rent these suckers out. And I'm trying to be like you one day, Jay. I'm trying to have a big net worth and you know, have money coming out of my ears like you over there. <laughs> all right. So there's three topics I want us to talk about, if time permits, between now and the end of the show which is going to wrap up in like between 20 and 25 minutes. So I want us to talk about how you raise private money. Sure. I want us to talk about how you find the deals because you're an expert at finding off-market deals. And just to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about, the definition of an off-market deal is simply it's not in the multiple listing service. It's a for sale by owner or it's a property that the person actually doesn't even know they're going to be selling yet until you contact them. So it's an off-market property. And then thirdly, if time permits, I want us to come back to what you said a moment ago. And that is, how is it you slow down the conversation? And really, what does your conversation sound like when you, as the acquisitionist, are talking to a seller? So let's come back to raising private money. Sure. So private money, I mean, you know, we can talk about where you find them, what do you say to them, how do you get the word out, do you negotiate on interest rate, or do you just present a particular program? So let me help us with the questions. First of all, okay, first of all, let's define who a private lender is. So in your world, Dave, who or what is a private lender? A private lender in my world is somebody who is or was a high income earner. 
their whole life. Maybe they had a small business or a really good job or a practice of some sort, like a dentist or a doctor. And now they are in the retirement years and they maybe have sold their practice, sold their business, but they have liquid cash and they want to be a passive investor. And we essentially you know, just educate these people, but who they are as a demographic or, you know, kind of you know, how they live is a high, a former high income earner, somebody who maybe has money, um, is interested in real estate, but is not wanting to do the day to day rehabbing houses and dealing with tenants. So could this possibly be like doctors or dentists or chiropractors or any of those type people? Absolutely. That is the, that's very, very good. Optometrists. We have a couple of eye doctors who lend us money. And really, it's just maybe somebody who is a high income earner or a former high income earner who, you know, they have money sitting in the stock market and they have money sitting in the bank and they just don't really understand how to really make money grow. They know they need to be making money grow. They know mutual funds, they know stocks, but they also know that there's another way and they just are open to learning about it. And that's, that's a key little thing here, Jay, is... If you're out there raising private money and you're new, don't raise private money from somebody who's smarter with money than you are. Some some money person. You don't want to raise money from real estate people. If you and I, Jay, were lending our money out to somebody who's brand new, we understand it better than they do. The terms are heavily going to favor us. And you make a good point, Dave. And that the reason is, is that when you are schooled and you know what's going on, you don't lend the same way you borrow, do you? No, no. So these are people who they have money. They're smart to understand that there is another way to make money in real estate. Um, but these are not like hard money lenders. These are not self-proclaimed lenders. You actually teach them to be a lender. And a lot of the way we do this, Jay, is we help them pull money or transfer their money out of the stock market and put it into a self-directed Roth IRA. And we link them up with a self-directed Roth IRA custodian. And then all the lending happens out of that is very, very common in my world. Yes, I've got 48 private lenders right now funding our business and funding our deals. And over half of them are using self-directed IRAs that we introduce them to. In fact, 100% of our private lenders utilizing that strategy. In fact, 100% of our private lenders coming from our warm market or people that we had some kind of relationship with never heard of private money, never heard of self-directed IRAs. So what I do, Dave, and I'm sure you do too, is I frame myself as a teacher. How about you? I do frame myself as, as really a, an expert, you know, and reputation is key, Jay, and you got to earn your stripes. Like when we were first borrowing private money, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about how bad the terms were. But those early days of borrowing really expensive money, that's what gave us the track record because we had to kick and scratch. And, you know, you've got to earn your stripes some way. And I'll just say that to your listeners. If you're brand new, it's okay to pay a little bit more than a guy who's got a couple thousand deals under his belt. He's earned his stripes. He's drove the cost of money down with his experience. But we used to pay astronomical rates and give away equity, this, that, and the other, just to get our foot in the door. But once that experience started to build up, the cost of money came down and we're much more easily able to educate people just based on previous deals and kind of how, how it all works. But yeah, very much you got to got to educate them. Yeah. So, Dave, you know, in my world, there's two primary markets or categories where we get private money and where we do business with the individuals. That's people that we already have some kind of relationship with. And then there are those people that we don't have a relationship with, but we're looking to start a relationship. So here's my question. The majority of your private money and private lenders, did you already know these people and have some kind of relationship? Or are the, were these people brand new to your world when they started hearing about your private lending program? Already had a relationship. So our very first private money lender was somebody that I used to wholesale deals to. It was a real estate guy, and that's why the terms weren't too favorable. That's why I learned. <laughs> yeah. um, but then from there, it came from, you know, a woman, a friend of ours. So there was already a relationship there. She introduced us to another friend. He was kind of like 
the next level of money raising. And from the experience built there, it really just came from friends of friends, you know, referral. So there is kind of some kind of warm relationship there. And really, I can't stress enough, like you got to get out there, get some experience under your belt. And the more you do, the more the money starts pouring in. You know, you do a good job out there. You pay people back, which I know you teach very much, Jay. You guys, you teach it the right way. Your reputation is everything. You get your first couple deals under your belt and just wait. The money's going to start lining up for you. Just ask everybody. And let me just give a quick nugget here, Jay. It's much easier if you're uncomfortable asking somebody to be a private lender, just ask if they have any friends who might be interested. That's all you do. Just ask. You might, if you've got any friends, you know, this is what I do. It's so much easier of a conversation and so less pressure. Oh, you know what, Dave? That's exactly what I did with my very first private lender. I went up to him after church on Bible study on a Wednesday night, and and I asked to visit with him, you know, in private. And in short, I told him that I was now opening up my real estate investing business people to that I know and trust, and it's going to be by referral only. And I'm paying, you know, really, really high rates of return safely and securely. And I said, you know, you know, everybody in this town, you're plugged in, you know, you're, you've been self-employed, you're an entrepreneur, you're all involved in the Rotary Club. When you run across somebody that's complaining, now this was 10 years ago, okay, but it still works today. I said, when you run across somebody that's complaining about what they're getting in the, on their certificates of deposit or, you know, the volatility of the stock market, would you mind referring them to me for my high paying program? And of course, you can imagine what his next statement or question was. And that was, well, what have you got in mind there, Brother Jay? And he became, you know, my next private lender. So you're exactly right. Just asking them to spread the word. So, Dave, the majority of the private money that you've raised, have you done it with one-on-one conversations or have you done any kind of group presentations like uh, private lender luncheons? I did. I, you know what? And I have not thought about this in so long, Jay. It's so funny to have this memory. I remember because we've done a ton of turnkey sales, you know, and that's just- Now tell my I'm, audience what a turnkey sale is. A turnkey sale is where we buy a home with private money and we fix it up and we get it rented out. And then instead of keeping it as a rental, we sell it to another investor who's wanting to buy a rental property, but maybe they live in California, but they want to invest in Ohio where the numbers make much more sense. Right. That's really how we built a lot through the early years. We were strictly, I mean, it was it was very difficult to wholesale back then because the market was different. But you know, we had a whole flipping business of selling turnkey properties, and then we would, you know, manage the property for the person that we sold to. So we've done a ton of that. And I remember one time being out in California, we used to take these trips to California and make presentations to buyers you know, because we used to sell turnkey properties out in California. So one event that really I'm, I'm thinking about here, I felt outmatched, Jay. There was all these other turnkey people who were way more experienced than I was. And I was like, I can't even compete with these guys. So I went up there, not even, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to show my product. Their product looks way better than mine. This was the early years. So I just completely flipped the script And I just said, hey, this is what we're doing. We're buying rental properties. If anybody's interested in maybe like a JV type of arrangement or something like that, I'm happy to discuss that with you. You know, we we borrow private money from people all the time. It could be passive for you and we'll be out there in the streets doing the work. I flipped and everything. Everybody wanted to do business with me and nobody even bought any of the turnkey properties. And and we still have money on the street today. It just literally came as a light bulb. I'm like, I can't compete with these guys because their rehabs look amazing. Their properties look way better than ours do. I'm not even going to show any pictures of our properties. Hey, let's just see if anybody wants to partner up and, and do this with us. Sure enough, man, we raised a bunch of money. Well, hey, look, you know why that worked so amazingly well for you. You saw what everybody else was doing and you did the opposite. <laughs> I did. Yeah, really. I mean, and that just came from fear, you know, because I was the young buck in the in the room. So it all turned out pretty well. But I have not thought about that in, in several years. That's really the only group type of thing I have done. The majority of it is more of a one-on-one type of thing. And and that's how it is. You know, you train these people to be a lender and sometimes you fire them as a lender. I, mean, I don't know in your experience if you've ever fired a lender. You ever deal with a private lender who's just constantly calling you every single week and wanting to know how it all works and when do I get paid back this night? And I'm said, hey, look, 
you realize we did a three year term here. Don't do it. <laughs> you want to get paid back immediately. Like it really works. So there's, t- there's been times in the past as well, Jay, where we've had to fire a lender. We've turned them down because it's just that it's not, you know, conducive to do business with somebody who is just that worried. It's probably going to lead to just a lot of wasted time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. The, the closest I've come to firing a private lender is telling them no. And here's yeah. what I mean by that. You know, I've got a very simple private lending program. I offer a interest rate. It's all collateralized and secured by the single family house. And that's the rate they get. In fact, Dave, you've probably heard me say in all the millions of dollars I've raised in private money, I've yet to ask for any money. We don't ask for money. We make the program available. And if they're interested, then, you know, we'll call them back up with a deal. But anyway, I had a private lender a few years ago that had done a few deals with me and he, anyway, he was loaded, retired. Anyway, he called me up and says, Jay, you know, I I like your private lending program, but I don't want to be a private lender anymore. I want to be a joint venture partner and get a piece of the action because I want some of the equity. I said, great. You need to find yourself another real estate investor to do business with. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't do that program. I said, I do what's best. I do the deals. I find the deals. We find them, we rehab them, we sell them. And my private lenders do what they're best at. And that is loan money, sit home, collect check, and that's it. Yeah. And of course, you can guess what happened after that. We continue to do business because where else is he going to get this deal, right? And so, you know, I tell people, stand your ground. You got your program. You know, I don't blame him. I mean, you know, his greed glands were starting to swell up in his neck. And I can't blame him for, you know, so I just had to help him get his greed glands under control. I like it. Yeah. Stand your ground. Keep your, keep your program. Okay. So we got private money. Okay. Let's talk about finding the deals, Dave, baby. I mean, I don't care what your exit strategy is or anybody's exit strategy. If you're buy and hold, you know, build the portfolio like you've done, or you're flipping and you're flipping some, or if you're a wholesaler, and you know your exit strategy is assignment fees or whatever you got to find the deals so you're in columbus ohio right now by the way let me just tell everybody that might be in the columbus ohio area and they don't have to be in the columbus ohio area if you want to get a high rate of return safely and securely we're going to give you dave's contact information here at the end of the show i mean you got a guy that's done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deals a safe place to, you know, invest your uh, liquid capital or your retirement funds. Anyway, we'll give that information out to you. So anyway, you're up there in the Columbus, Ohio area. What is hot and working now, Dave, on finding these off-market properties? First and foremost, that's a great question. And I really can't stress this this enough, especially if you're, you're somewhat new. It is better to be a sniper than a shotgun. You've got to know what to go after. You've got to have that clarity. Don't just blanket the whole area and county full of all your marketing and direct mail. We do a lot of direct mail. We can start there, but I'm not blasting mail out because it's expensive and I'm cheap. Jay, I mean, and by the way, in your experience, and maybe you can uh, attest to this as well, the private money lenders out there, they don't really like the big flashy guy who looks all cool and hot. They want to know that the person that they're doing business with is a good steward of money. So when a private money lender wants to do lunch or something like that, I'm meeting them over at Panera. I'm not getting you know prime rib and steak. That's not how this business works with these private money lenders. It is a relationship kind of thing. But with the being a good steward of money, I don't want to just blanket a whole area full of all this different postcards and this and that. I would rather be a sniper. So you got to know what to go after. And I do know what to go after. So I only want to go after homes where the rent to value ratio makes sense. So I don't want a home that's worth you know, 450,000, but it's only going to rent for $2,000 a month. That rent and value ratio is way out of whack. I ideally want the value and the rent to be 1% or greater. So let's boil that down. Let's, let's talk, let's keep it simple. And these figures are not going to relate to California, but let's just keep the math simple. Now, are you talking the as is value or the after repaired value or the value of that single family house in a good rentable condition. Define value. 
Thank you for, for slowing me down so I can clarify. Sometimes I get on a roll, but I'm talking about the after repair value and I'm talking about what it will rent for after it's fixed up. So let's say the after repair value is $100,000. In my world, it's got to rent for $1,000 or more per month. It's got to rent for at least 1% or better. Okay. So does that play out? If it's worth $150,000, it's got to rent for $1,500? Yeah, that's, it does. And that's a good rule of thumb to live by. So here's the thing. There's going to be a cap in every market because you know where your rental rates are for your local market. And for me, I do cap it off at about fifty, uh, at you know, one hundred and fifty thousand dollar after repair value houses because in my marketplace, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house is not renting for fifteen hundred a month. It's down to fourteen hundred to thirteen hundred. So you see, I start to slip below the one percent rule when I get up and around one fifty. Now. Let me clarify something else here. That's the cap. Now, there's also a minimum because we could find things that are going to be way bigger than the 1% rule. Let's pretend a house that's after repair value 50 that we could rent for 950 a month. Well, that's way better than 1%, but I don't want those houses either, Jay. I don't want the too low end of homes because it gives me less options and it's a harder clientele to work with. It gives me less options because banks, as you probably know, banks are only really willing to lend to investors like us. If I wanted to refinance, the bank is only willing to give me 75% of the value. Now, the bank also has a minimum loan amount of $50,000. So, if the minimum loan amount is 50,000 and I can only borrow a loan for 75% of the value, something needs to be worth at least 70, 75,000 or the bank is not even ever going to refi me. I lose that whole exit strategy and lose the option to do that at some point in the future. So for me personally, I want it to be below 150, but I want it to be above that 90,000, that's my sweet spot. I don't want it to be too low end for many reasons. Number one, they're harder to manage. A lot of times those properties are older and need more work. And then also, you know, if I wanted to refinance, oftentimes the bank is not willing readily to lend on the lower end stuff. So I found my sweet spot to be in affordable housing where the rent to value ratio is 1% or greater. And I like to be 90 to 150 is where I play ball. So let me give you a real life scenario, okay? And give me your thoughts on it. So I've got this single family house that I bought here in Morehead City, North Carolina. I bought it, oh, just a few weeks ago. It's a pretty house. Literally, it needs nothing. I mean, it's pretty. It's a three bed, two bath. It's got 1,400 square feet. The appraised value easy right now is $150,000, okay? It will rent for $1,000 a month, okay? I bought it for $100,000. So I got different exit strategies here, all kinds of exit strategies. I got, I got this beautiful home. I mean, literally, it needs nothing. You say, Jay, how in the world did you buy a $150,000 home in Moorhead City for $100,000, it will appraise for 150 and it'll rent for 1000 a month. What happened? Well, just real quick, the people had it in MLS. They had three full price offers. Find out it's got a $7,000 foundation issue that needs to be fixed that you wouldn't be able to tell just by walking around in the house. And they want to buy their dream home and they've got to close in three weeks. And if they don't close in three weeks, they are losing their dream home, so they're willing to sell it to me. And they put money in their pocket for 100000 So, again, here's the numbers. It's worth 150 I can rent it for 1000 I bought it for 100000 with private money, okay? So, at 7%, all right, I'm less than 700 a month on my outgo. So, Dave, what's my exit strategy? I mean, I can cash out on it and pocket a check. I can rent it out for positive cash flow. I can turn it into an Airbnb. What do I do with this house? 
Well, we got we got to get more information first because there's different purchase options as well. My question is this: When did they buy this property? I don't know when they bought. Well, let's see. When did they buy it? I know they bought it long ago enough for it to have about fifteen thousand dollars equity. So their payoff was like eighty five thousand dollars. But I don't know how long ago they bought it. So, I mean, we're, what, where my mind goes as an acquisition specialist is, hey, do they have a mortgage? Did they already have a mortgage on it? If so, what was the rate on that? Because, you know, chances are that mortgage was so far deep, you know, 20, 15, 20 years into the mortgage, that sucker's paying down principal like no other. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I would have bought it subject to, but I yeah. couldn't buy it subject to because that would have prevented them from buying their okay. dream home. That was my next question. Did they need to sell in order to buy yeah, the because home? That's the only reason they sold it to me at a $50,000 discount is because they're getting ready to lose their dream home. Exactly. So I had to pay cash. Oh, it would have been an even much sweeter deal at subject to, but they wouldn't okay. have sold it to me at that price unless I had all cash yeah. to pay them off. Of course. I love subject to, and that's, uh, well, we'll do that on a, another call, you know, for your listeners. So my question is this, what kind of terms did you get on the private money? 7%, but was it interest only? Was it, you know, were you making monthly payments? Was it accrued interest? Was it for one year, yeah. five years? Yeah, yeah five so years, interest only, quarterly payments. Quarterly payments, excellent. So what is your payment on 100K? That's $7,000 a year divided by 12 is, you know, what is that, like 585 a month? What's your payment? It's, yeah, it's like less than six. So right here, so it's 7,000 per year. And okay. I got quarterly payments. And so I'm paying, well, to make, let's look at it on a monthly because if you're looking at rent, you really exactly. gotta look, you gotta look at the monthly. So the outgo per month is 583 a month. Okay. Yeah. Five, I said 585. I was pretty close. So what I would do if you got five years, I, me personally, I would just rent that sucker out. You got great terms on money. See, here's the thing. A deal becomes more valuable and your model can change with different terms on money, right? You can afford to pay a little bit more for a house if you have really good terms on the capital that you're using. When you're paying too much for private money, when you're paying a high interest rate and this and that, you're forced to pay a low ball price. You have really good terms on money. You got 7% interest only, you don't get quarterly payments. You know, you can rent that sucker out. It's a really strong cash flow for yourself. Your payment's 583, you're renting it for a thousand. You got a boatload of equity. That's what I would do is just rent it out. If you wanted to do a rent to own kind of thing, you could do that. I'm not a huge fan of the rent to own for several reasons. Number one is I rarely see them succeed and I don't want to be part of a program that fails all the time. And number two, banks don't like that. If you want to refi this sucker in the future at some point, Jay, and put a 4% mortgage on it and pull out tax-free money on a cash out refi, but you got an option recorded against this house, the bank's not going to feel comfortable lending to you. So in my world, I would just do a straight up rental to a qualified resident and I would sit that renter down and let them know this house is in great condition. And if you mess this up, we are going to make sure you never rent from anyone ever again and scare the bejesus out of them because that's kind of how you have to do this. You've got to make sure these people are taking care of your assets. But that's what I would do. Awesome, man. Dave, I knew you'd have the answer. Oh, my lands, Dave, I can't believe it. We're already out of time. Mercy, I've got to have you back on the show for us to talk about actually how your conversation sounds as an expert acquisitionist when you're actually talking to a motivated seller. So will you come back, man? Let's do it. Yeah. Awesome. So one last question, and then we're going to give it out to everybody as to how folks can continue the conversation with you. What's your best advice for a new real estate investor that is looking to do their first deal and haven't done their first deal yet? I would find somebody with similar core values who's in the business, somebody that you feel good about, in your local market who is doing business and doing deals and you just feel good about this person, you've got to have the same core values, but then offer to add as much value as you possibly can to this person for free, for zero money, add as much value as you possibly can, you know, just for in exchange to learn and then show up every day and really show that you're committed. Any successful person in real estate, when we come across, and I'm sure you're the same way, Jay, if somebody approaches us and really wants to give it their all and, and do it, we're happy to teach anybody and they don't have to pay anything. They just got to show that commitment. So I would say find somebody with similar core values, 
who has what you're looking to create and offer to help them for free. That's awesome, Dave. So Dave, I know we got a ton of people wanting to continue the conversation with you. How can they locate and follow Dave Perichin? So the best place to find me is on Instagram and you can reach me. Uh, my handle is at the real Dave P. So at the real Dave P and that's P as in Perichin. And take just a moment and tell folks uh, why they should follow you on Instagram. I love what you do there with the, with your videos. What's going on on your, what's going on on your Instagram? So I'm a big real estate nerd. Like I think you are as well. It's easy to become a nerd about something when, you know, you become financially free and I am constantly talking about finance deals. I still go on appointments. I still get contracts. I put three properties in contract last this past weekend. So I debrief all my appointments. I talk about what's working, what's not, where I mess up. I, I admit to my faults as well, but I'm always on there talking finance, real estate, deal structure, and it's all free. So I, I'm just a big real estate nerd at heart and I'm happy to help as many people as I possibly can through my videos and whatnot. Dave, my lands, it was awesome to have you on. I'm going to have you back on the show. Thank you so much, man, for coming. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, folks, thank you for tuning in. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Be sure, again, if you're on iTunes, give us a high star rating. Rate us a subscribe, rate and review. If you're on YouTube, be sure and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the content. So thank you for joining. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. We'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.